Welcome and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Kristen Shuck. I'm the business manager of the JAMS Boston office. Our program today is a fireside chat between two retired judge, uh, BLS judges, Judge Mar Margaret Hinkle and Judge Judy Fabricant. Uh, judge Hinkle joined JAMS in 2011 after 18 years on the Superior Court. Uh, since joining JAMS, Judge Hinkle has served extensively as a mediator, arbitrator, special master, neutral evaluator on a variety of disputes. Um, Judge Fabricant joined JAMS this past January after retiring as the Superior Court's Chief Justice in 2021. Since joining JAMS, Judge Fabricant has already served as a mediator, arbitrator, and neutral evaluator and is also available for special master work. Both Judges Hinkle and Fabricant were the administrative judge of the BLS during their tenure, and both also received the Boston Bar Association's Haskell Cohn Award for Distinguished Judicial Service. As you can tell from these backgrounds, our program today promises to be very insightful. It will be an informative conversation that will help shine some light on how our retired judges view their role in ADR, as well as what they think a good advocate's approach should be to complex business cases. Um, we're going to encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to enter any questions. We'll hold all questions until the end, um, but you know, as they come to you, feel free to put them in that Q&A function, and we will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the session. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to our panelists to start the conversation. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I have the luxury today of interrogating my friend, Judy Fabricant, about a variety of issues. Um, as uh, all of you in attendance know, we were advertised as conducting an interview today, which would be an interesting and an informative conversation. This was the description that will help shine the light on how retired judges view their role in the dispute resolution process as well as what they think a good advocate's approach should be to a complex business case. We will touch on these subjects. However, I'm going to be asking the question and Judy will be responding to my question for the most part. She may occasionally ask me some questions, but she is on center stage today. And I think with that, Judy, we all know that you served on the Superior Court for a very long time, including sitting in the BLS, and we all know that you served as Chief Justice of the Superior Court. Would you please begin by telling us in some detail about the work that you did on the court? Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you for doing this, Margaret. I really appreciate it. Um, I served on the Superior Court for 25 years, ending last July. Uh, the first 18 of those years were as a regular sitting judge, including five years in the business litigation session. Uh, and then in 2014, I became chief of the Superior Court. When I was sitting, I handled the full range of work that the Superior Court does, which is enormously broad uh, in, in civil cases that includes complex business disputes and other contract issues. It includes corporate governance, trade secrets, non-competition, insurance coverage, all kinds of torts ranging from slip and fall to professional malpractice to products liability. It includes construction, land use, uh, environmental matters, employment, review of administrative determinations, and almost every other kind of civil lit litigation. Um, I, I often said, and, and I would still say, one of the things I loved most about being a Superior Court judge was the wide variety and the opportunity to learn about new fields with nearly every case. Uh, you, you can sit on the Superior Court for decades and still run into something you've never seen before. And, and that's part of what makes it, it really fun and, and interesting. At, as Chief Justice, I saw my main role as overseeing how the court organizes its work so as to serve the public as efficiently and effectively as possible. That involved identifying and promoting consistent best practices in case management, overseeing education and mentoring for judges, especially new judges, and participating in policy making for the trial court as a whole. And, and of course, during my last 15 months or so in that role, uh, we were in the most acute phases of the pandemic, uh, which is still with us, but 
but perhaps less acute than it used to be. And the greatest challenge, of course, was to reorganize everything in, in the court's processes so as to accomplish as much as we could as promptly as possible, despite the limitations that we all faced. I know there was a lot of frustration in many quarters, maybe uh, certainly in the civil bar, I was going to say maybe most in the civil bar, but actually I know, I know it was equal among civil and criminal practitioners for different reasons. Uh, I'm sure that that frustration continues, uh, but I have to say that I'm proud of, of what we accomplished under unprecedented circumstances. We got an awful lot done, uh, even when we couldn't conduct jury trials, uh, and, and I'm proud of that. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there particular skills, Judy, that you believe you bring to JAMS based on your experience as a trial court judge and your experience as chief justice of our court? I, I think listening is the essence of the judicial role. Uh, it's also the essence of the, the management role that I had as, as chief. Uh, and it's essential to effective work as a neutral. Parties in, in all kinds of cases want to be heard. They want to be seen, they want to be recognized. And when they are, when they feel that they truly are heard, they can begin to see how others might perceive their case. Uh, they can begin to evaluate their positions, identify their interests and, and consider solutions. So I, I think it's the, the skill of listening that uh, I bring that's certainly not unique, but I think it's something that judges develop, uh, and, and I feel I did develop as a judge. Um, sometimes listening seems inefficient, uh, and, and that's true, I think, in court, and it's also true in, in dispute resolution processes. Sometimes the right answer may seem apparent early on, uh, but one of the things I learned as a judge is that everyone benefits from a process in which everyone feels fully heard. One of the skills that a judge especially hones in the business litigation session is getting to the heart of a multifaceted complex dispute, breaking it down into pieces, finding a way to organize the pieces so as to get to resolution as efficiently as possible. I see that approach as directly applicable to work in dispute resolution, uh, especially in complex cases. So I'm trying to do that as jam at jams, uh, and and I think I bring some skill in that. Judy, having um, served as Chief Justice until less than a year ago, you've now made reference to the business litigation session a few times in your responses. Would you tell us how you see its role in superior court practice? It's been there for 22 years. It is fully institutionalized as an integrated part of the superior court. The court is fully committed to it. I certainly was as chief. I know the current chief is. Uh, I, I think uh, it, is, it is permanent. I think there's just no question about that at this point. Uh, and I think it is widely recognized as the premier forum for litigation of complex business disputes in Massachusetts. It's widely recognized around the country. Uh, and, and quite often uh, we see contracts in which parties agreed at the very beginning of the relationship that any dispute would be resolved in the BLS. Um, the number of cases in the two BLS sessions compared with the number of cases in other superior court sessions and the sharing of the two sessions by consistent pairs of experienced judges. Now, when I say consistent, judges retire, new judges come, there are changes in time, uh, but there is a serious effort to have consistency over at least a few years uh, in each of the two sessions. All of those factors mean uh, that each case gets focused judicial attention throughout its life. So I, I think that really helps uh, to keep a complex dispute on track. It, long ago, some 22 years ago, uh, there was a, a perception, there was controversy over a perception that business cases were getting special treatment. At that point, that 
at this point, that's ancient history. Uh, it, there's general recognition that especially complex cases need a level of attention that's much harder for a judge to give in, in a regular session. Uh, not every case needs that. In fact, not every case needs litigation at all. Some disputes are better resolved outside the judicial forum. But for those cases that do need it, the BLS is the place to get it. One of the um, things that uh, is not mentioned in your JAMS uh, biography is the fact that uh, at the 150th anniversary of the Superior Court, uh, you edited a series of reflections of the justices. And in that reflection, the judge who first served as the um, BLS, the initial BLS judge, Alan Van Gessel, a former colleague of ours, a former colleague of mine in private practice, talked about the fact that the Superior Court was a living branch of government serving the litigating public. It always will need, he said, to respond to the times while learning from its past successes and failures. He made reference to the fact that he was the session's first full-time judge. Do you feel that the BLS has served that function? Absolutely, absolutely. And it continues to serve that function. It did even in the darkest times of the pandemic. Uh, it, it continued, it continued to resolve cases and, and I think it, it will continue uh, permanently. There has been some recent uh, publicity in Mass Lawyers Weekly uh, about the fact that there have been some bench notes from the sitting BLS judges. Would you like to comment on, on that? I read the bench notes. Um, a couple of things stood out to me. One is that the answers of the four judges were consistent. That didn't surprise me at all. Um, they should be consistent. Uh, the experience that a lawyer has going into the BLS and the experience that a lawyer has going into the Superior Court in general should be consistent. It shouldn't be a matter of individual uh, preferences. Um, so I was glad to see that the answers were consistent. The other thing that stuck out to me was that many of the answers made reference to rules and published procedural guidance. That too, I was very glad to see uh, because that tells us that the judges are applying the rules and they're enforcing the rules. They expect lawyers to read the rules, be familiar with them and follow the rules. Uh, and I think that is as it should be. Uh, so I was glad to see the bench notes. Um, many of us remember that back in the 90s, I think it was, the Mass Bar Association published uh, a volume of judicial preferences uh, that had most, if not all, of the Superior Court judges. I think it was less consistent in those days. Um, I, I think the idea that we should provide a consistent experience uh, to the bar and the public is an idea that has gained increasing currency over that time. Following uh, up a bit on that, what advice do you have, Judy, for practitioners who are litigating in the BLS? I would start with the same advice that uh, we give lawyers about appearing in any court. Be prepared, be candid, be civil and respectful to everyone. Talk to opposing counsel early and often. Resolve what you can resolve so that you don't spend time and money putting resolvable disputes into formal motions. Reserve the court's time for the things that you really can't resolve on your own. Focus your presentation when you do go to court on a very few most significant issues in a logical sequence. Address questions and vulnerabilities head on. Don't shift the topic in response to a question you'd rather not answer. That just shows that you don't have an answer. The main difference in the BLS is to recognize that your case will get a high level of judicial attention at every stage. 
You can expect the judge to become familiar with your case and to be open to case-specific approaches to scheduling and sequencing that might be less feasible in other sessions. Once trial dates are set in the business litigation session, they will be firm. Uh, the Superior Court has certainly made enormous efforts over a, a substantial period of time to have firm trial dates in every session. The pandemic did some damage to that, uh, but I think you can still expect that in the business litigation session, trial dates once set will be firm. And even though the business litigation sessions have fewer cases than most other sessions, the cases are all complex and the number of motions and the volume of paper filed in each case is enormous. The judge has a lot to read and a lot to write in each case. Sometimes lawyers organize their filings in a way that helps the judge find what's most pertinent to any part of the proceeding, and sometimes less so. I think the lawyers who are here with us today would do better to be in the former group. Margaret, do you have advice? I endorse everything uh, that you've said. Maybe add a few other comments. Um, one of the invitees here today, one of the attendees, I should say, was uh, part of a very complex dispute uh, that I spent considerable time during my years in the BLS um, involved in. And uh, he will remember that we had an enormous number of discovery motions. That's one of the things I think when you question any sitting judge about things that they uh, least like, the response will have some comment about discovery motions. So my advice is with regard to discovery motions, do your best to resolve them without the need to bring them to the BLS judges. Help the BLS judge in any way that you can. The judges sitting in that session, though they have fewer cases, have more complex cases, have much more paper to be involved in. I can recall a summary judgment motion that I had in which eight bankers boxes of documents accompanied the motion. Be realistic about what a judge can possibly do in advance of hearing the motion. Help guide the court to what the critical issues are in resolving the motion. Work with opposing counsel to do that in a way as fair as possible. Given the volume of filings in the BLS, um, does that have implications for the judgments that lawyers should make about dispositive motions? Definitely. Um, it, of course you should file a motion if you believe it's well-founded. But filing dispositive motions should not be automatic. And, and sometimes judges uh, have the perception that it is automatic, that, that there's a dispositive motion, at least one dispositive motion in every case, even though sometimes it, it just seems like everybody could have predicted that the case is not going to resolve on a dispositive motion. Don't file motions that have little chance of prevailing. And don't file partial dispositive motions that won't advance the case but do file partial motions or discuss with the court another tailored approach if you believe there is an issue that the court can resolve early that would substantially advance the case. The judges wanna do that. They wanna move the case along. And if you can persuade a judge that there is an issue that will move the case along, the judges in the BLS can be open to that uh, and will be open to that in a way that is much more difficult in the regular sessions. The BLS has the capacity to tailor a schedule uh, to the particular case. Do you agree? Yes. Um, over the years that I've been at JAMS, um, I have mediated substantial numbers of cases uh, in, which are in the BLS. And I have on occasion advised the parties that it does make some sense to raise before the BLS judge the possibility of addressing a particular issue that seems to be the impediment to resolution of the case. And I have been gratified when I've learned that that approach has been taken. I know the BLS judges are eager to find ways to help in the resolution of cases. 
And I would advise that that approach be taken by those in attendance who are in that position. Any comment on that, Judy? Yeah, no, I think that I, I have also advised parties to do, to do that. I certainly did uh, when I was sitting in the BLS uh, take up particular issues when the parties persuaded me that there was good reason to do that, even if it was outside of the, the usual sequence. Judy, let me shift our conversation a bit. Turning to dispute resolution outside traditional litigation, which is now your work at JAMS, we sometimes hear calls for the court to expand court provided ADR offerings or to mandate mediation or other forms of ADR. Would you comment on that? Do you think it's likely to happen and would you favor it? My thinking is the same as it was when I was Chief Justice of the Superior Court, which is the same as it was uh, when I was a sitting judge in the Superior Court. Lawyers who practice in the Superior Court know how to get access to mediation and other forms of dispute resolution, and they know when the time is right to do it in their cases. They don't need the court to tell them. And in most Superior Court cases, the use of dispute resolution services through JAMS or other providers is economically feasible and beneficial. There are some where that's not the case. And in that category of cases, the Superior Court offers mediation and conciliation through one staff person and several volunteers, including some very generous retired judges uh, and lawyers. Those services are enormously valuable, but I do not expect that the court will devote its limited resources to significant expansion of court provided ADR services. I don't see that happening in the Superior Court. That has happened and I think will happen more in other departments of the trial court, but I don't see it happening in the Superior Court. I would not favor mandatory mediation in Superior Court cases because that would override the judgment of the lawyers and would delay trials in the cases that need trials. And it, we know that there are some states where there are mandatory mediation programs. Um, I think mediators, uh, I have heard from mediators who have handled those kind of matters uh, that often people come in because they're checking a box uh, or they're doing some uh, informal discovery. Uh, they're doing what they're required to do, but it's often just not a very productive process. Um, so I, I don't favor that. Um, I don't think it's likely to happen uh, in the Superior Court. In, in many cases, uh, maybe most cases, mediation is appropriate and useful at the right time. But the lawyers are in the best position to know when the time is right and to choose the form that they think most effective for their case. Margaret, what do you think? Over my years at JAMS, uh, I've come to the conclusion, Judy, that there is a particular time when mediation is not very effective. And I think many of the attendees recognize that. And that's when there is an underlying agreement of some sort that mandates that mediation must occur before a case is filed in court or before a case is arbitrated. That is an opportunity I recognize for discovery, uh, for getting some sense of what the other side is all about. But in my view, it is rarely successful. Yeah. Um, otherwise, in terms of the best time for mediation, Judy, um, over the years, as I reflect on it, I think that um, coming to mediation, if there's a summary judgment motion that has been filed and has not yet been heard, also has questionable chances of success. It has seemed to me that I'm very often then provided with the summary judgment papers. Uh, somewhere along the course of the day, I'll be asked what my view is about what the judge is likely to do. And of course, I would never an answer a question like that. But I think that that may also be a time when it might be wiser to wait until after the summary judgment motion is decided. And then finally, of course, um, you know better than I do, based on your experience with the st statistics in the Superior Court, um, 
there is a opportune time for mediation before, right before trial occurs for a variety of reasons in any instance where there is likely uncertainty about the process, which is where what there always is. And speaking of that, what are the latest statistics, Judy, in terms of the number of cases that are filed that get resolved short of um, resolution by the court? Um, several times when I was chief, I made efforts in various ways to try to figure out what percentage of cases settled. And there was no really obvious, really reliable way to do that, but I came up with various proxies for, for how to figure that out. And every time I tried to figure it out, the conclusion that I came to was the number of cases resolved by verdict in a jury trial after trial the percentage of all civil cases filed in the Superior Court that was resolved in that manner was about 2%. So 98% of cases were resolved in some other way. Now, some cases, there's no right to a jury trial. Some cases, there's no right to a trial at all. Some cases, the parties have agreed to waive a jury trial. Some cases, there's a jury demand filed, but then at some point, the the parties do waive a jury trial. So that 2% figure, you know, you'd, you'd probably, if you wanted to have a re reliable estimate of how many cases settle, it's not gonna be 98%, it's gonna be something short of 98%, but I still think it's gonna be in the 90s. So the question is, when do they settle? Um, my sense is there's two good times. One time in certain kinds of cases is before there's been a lot of money spent on litigation. And in certain kinds of cases, at a very early stage, everybody knows a lot, uh, especially in a case where uh, there's insurance available and there's been a claim made to the insurance company and there's been a lot of materials gathered to present to the insurance company to make a claim to the insurance company. Well, in that kind of case, Everybody knows a lot before anybody files a complaint in court. So in that kind of case, people know enough that they're in a pretty good position to settle before they've spent a lot of money on litigation. That's a good time then for mediation early in that kind of case. The other situation where, in my view, cases tend to settle is much later after everybody knows everything they need to know, after all of the discovery has been done, after there have been rulings on the major legal issues, either in the form of summary judgment or in some other form. Uh, and at that point, everybody's in a very good position to evaluate their position uh, and reach resolution. So, so that's my view based mainly on, on what I've seen in court. Let me shift gears. Um, we've been zooming. Um for the past half hour or so. Uh, I wanna ask you how, in your opinion, the use of remote hearings will alter the practice in court and it will alter the practice of re dispute resolution uh, at JAMS. Um, so I think every, everybody knows that in April of 2020, uh, in the trial court as a whole, all judges got Zoom licenses. We all had training on, I had never heard of Zoom before that. Um, some people had, but I think probably most of us hadn't. Uh, but we all got training on how to use it. Uh, and then everybody started doing everything on Zoom. We also very quickly adopted electronic filing, even though we didn't have in, in the court system, we didn't have the, the internal software to give judges and clerks and everybody else access to all the materials that was filed electronically, but we did adopt electronic filing for all civil cases. Um, so we made an enormous transition very quickly. Uh, and that was how we were able to keep going, even when, uh, even during the short period of time when courts were closed to the public. And then after that, uh, we had a much longer period of time when courts were open to the public, but there was an awful lot happening by way of Zoom, uh, as well as some things happening in person in courtrooms. 
Um, I think we all discovered, uh, we discovered a couple of things. One thing uh, we didn't discover because it wasn't new, we all knew it, um, but it brought home to us how inadequate the technology is in the trial court. And I wanna make a little plug. I hope everybody is contacting their legislators to express support for the court technology bond bill because that's the only way that technology is going to come into the modern era uh, in the trial court. Um, we also all discovered that it has good points and bad points. Um, it allows a lot of people to attend from a lot of places who couldn't otherwise. And I think when, one thing we noticed was in summary judgment hearings in the Superior Court, the clients would be there on Zoom when they probably wouldn't have been there in person uh, in a hearing in the courtroom. And that was, that was a good thing uh, and still is. I think that's still happening in a lot of cases and it's a good thing. We discovered that the kind of matter where you might have been standing up in the courtroom for at most 10 minutes, but you might have been waiting there for two hours and you might have spent an hour commuting each way, um, you don't need to do that. That can be scheduled very precisely. It can be done by video conference and that can be much more efficient. Um, I would say that technology can make all of us more efficient. JAMS has outstanding technology uh, from video conferencing to secure electronic filing. It's been sort of a, a luxury for me um, to, to have access to uh, that sort of modern um, facilities and, and equipment and support uh, that I wasn't used to. Um, and I'm enjoying that. Uh, technology can make all of us more efficient about for, for matters that involve substantive, substantive events, uh, I really have mixed views. Um, video conferencing meets the need when we can't be in person. Uh, it facilitates greater participation. But in my view, there is a lot of communication that happens in person that just doesn't work as well on a screen. Uh, so. I am happy to conduct events on Zoom if that's what parties prefer to do, but I'd rather be in person uh, as long as public health conditions permit. I feel that way especially strongly about evidentiary proceedings. Um, I think video presentations are, are just less effective. I, I do think though that we need to keep in mind things we have learned in recent years that should make us pause about what we used to think we knew about judging credibility. We, we used to have all kinds of views about how you could judge credibility from a witness's demeanor. You know, we had all kinds of ideas about whether the witness looks you in the eye or looks down or makes certain kinds of gestures and that kind of thing. And I think we have learned in recent years that we're just not so good at that. And that a lot of those things are specific to particular cultures, are different in different cultures. And, and we need to be skeptical about that. But that doesn't mean that demeanor is irrelevant uh, to evaluating credibility. And, and I just feel better able to do it in person. What do you think? Have you done um, evidentiary hearings on Zoom? Um. I have uh, conducted uh, arbitrations on, on Zoom. Uh, I have some questions about, I, I guess most of the arbitrations as I reflect on the last few years that I've conducted um, on Zoom have been hybrid. Uh, I have had some people uh, in the office um, and I have had uh, others participating by Zoom. Um, if in fact uh, it involves a, a witness who is lives far away from Boston, and of course during the heart of the pandemic, it was just not possible to travel, that's made some sense. Um, I find um, that it is uh, at times uh, difficult. I have some questions uh, about a fundamental issue, which is uh, if it's an arbitration, who is participating in, if it is being conducted on Zoom, 
who else might be involved. If we were conducted in per person, I, I would know everybody that was in the room. I don't always know that, and that's something that concerns me a bit. I have raised that question with counsel on occasion. Um, I also, when an attorney is with a client uh, during a, um, an interrogation, I have some difficulty often with the cameras and occasionally with the audibility of what is proceeding. My view on video conferencing in mediations is somewhat different. I was prepared to question its uh, utility at the outside of the pandemic. And I shifted gears considerably. And of course, it depends a lot on the nature of the dispute. Sometimes it depends on the extent to which I have knowledge of the participants and they have knowledge of me and my idiosyncrasies of which there are many. I think there is a considerable virtue uh, in mediations when, uh, for example, uh, claims representatives can be present rather than participating by phone, which was often the case uh, before the fact of video conferencing. Uh, I do recognize that the kind of comment when we're in person that can occur if I'm sitting, standing by the coffee machine and an attorney can come up to me and tell me to back off, I'm being too aggressive or maybe encouraging me to be more aggressive in terms of her client, uh, there are advantages to, to, to that approach. So I have, um, at, at this point, I, I think my conclusion is that there are times when, uh, in terms of mediation, when video conferencing is enormously effective. And there are times uh, when, when it isn't. And I have, I have less certainty about the arbitration process. Uh, I think for the reasons that you suggested. And I'm going to shift now in terms of another direction. Judy, I'd like you to talk about your work thus far at JAMS. What kinds of things have you been doing and what are you interested in doing? Um, I'm interested in all of the, the types of roles that JAMS handles, uh, mediation, arbitration, neutral evaluation, special master work. Uh, I, I think I have developed skills that uh, prepare me for that kind of work. Um, for mediation, uh, as a judge at every event, I would ask counsel about efforts to resolve the case or to narrow the issues and how I might be able to help with that. Uh, and I often felt that I was able to help sometimes by suggesting approaches that both sides might want to pursue, but neither one wanted to be the first to suggest. Um, I could suggest them and it might, might be more palatable that way. Sometimes there was something a, a lawyer might have already said to the client uh, or might intend to say to the client, but the client might be more receptive hearing it from the judge. Uh, and, and I felt like I developed a sense of that and, and uh, was able to help parties resolve matters. Um, as, as a mediator, of course, we have more time to spend with each case and we have the freedom to talk to each side separately. Um, that's, that's, of course, something judges don't do except in, in very unusual circumstances when all of the parties uh, agree to that. Um, it is, it, it's a luxury that, that I find to be, um, it, it makes a big difference for me. I feel like I can make use of that um, in, in, in effective ways. Um, it, it's very helpful in a mediation setting not to have the decision-making role. And, and I think that's something that lawyers sometimes need to keep reminding themselves that the mediator is not the decision maker and maybe need to keep reminding their clients that the mediator is not the decision maker. Ultimately, it's the parties who are the decision makers in mediation. Um, but I feel like I can take the experience of having been the decision maker uh, and help the parties explore the possibilities evaluate their positions and recognize the risks and the costs of litigation. And that can help get a matter resolved. 
based on um, the months that you've now been at JAMS uh, and on the mediations that you've had, what materials do you like to have from council before the mediation? Well, I, I, first of all, you have to promise me that you're gonna answer that question <laughs> because I need to know your answer. Um, based on my experience so far, I, I want basic information about the case and the parties, the status of the litigation, I want to know what's most important to the parties and a sense of potential areas for compromise. If it involves an area of law that I may not be familiar with uh, or that may have developed a great deal in the recent past, um, it's helpful to have a few citations of the most significant cases, which I will read. Um, so that I can think about the strengths and weaknesses on the legal issues. But it's not helpful to have a brief of the sort that a lawyer would file in court. A mediation memo, like anything else a lawyer does in litigation, has an element of advocacy, but it's not a summary judgment motion. The goal is not to persuade the mediator that your position is right. The mediator is not the decision maker. The goal is to help the mediator understand what's most important to your client, what you think is important to the other side, and where there might be common ground. That's how I see it. Margaret, is, is that consistent with your view? What I've traditionally done is to ask counsel in, before a mediation to provide me with two briefs, um, and probably I shouldn't be using the word brief here, but two position papers. The first is one that they would share with the other side, and the second is one that they would provide only to me. What I'm interested in, in knowing, obviously, is the status of the dispute, the particular, uh, if it's in court, um, you know, what's been going on in court, things of that sort. Uh, I often, um, as is my want, I guess, am inundated with summary judgment filings. I don't uh, read through everything that I'm provided in advance, but I do appreciate um, the uh, particular things that knowledge about the particular things that have happened in court, if it's in court already, that will influence the ability of the parties to resolve the case. I'm also interested in being provided with information about uh, settlement discussions that have occurred. Obviously, one of the virtues, uh, one of the things we can offer to parties um, in mediation based on the Massachusetts statute and the JAMS rule is confidentiality. And therefore, um, I feel that, that it is extraordinarily helpful for me in working with the parties to obtain information along that line. Uh, I also appreciate the fact, uh, and I'm mindful uh, of a particular mediation that I had uh, recently in which I was probably provided with 10,000 pages of paper in advance, but with, when both sides came in with the particular portions of the documents that were critical to my working with them and handed me a sheet of paper with something highlighted at the particular time that it was being addressed uh, by the client or by opposing counsel. Um, so I, I think that that summarizes every case is different um, and, and much depends on the particular status of the dispute at the time that it comes into jams, uh, obviously, as I think we've, we've already recognized. Let me um, now talk, uh, Judy, about arbitration. Obviously, it goes without question that there is, um, as you recognize already, um, an enormous overlap uh, with the judicial role in serving as an arbitrator. Do you feel that your work in the BLS particularly provided you with information in terms of preparing to be a JAMS arbitrator? So the BLS, as you know, handles many non-jury trials, uh, either because there was a contract that said, we're gonna do this without a jury or because the parties agreed ultimately to do it without a jury because the nature of the issues were such that they would be better presented to a judge. Um, I, I conducted many of those trials over the years. I issued many decisions with extensive, extensive factual findings and application of legal principles. Um, the intensive case management in the BLS also has much in common with the managed arbitration approach at JAMS. Uh, so I, I, think, I think I have 
considerable experience that is uh, applicable to arbitration. Um, the confidentiality of the process, of course, is different from what happens in court. And I think for the parties uh, in arbitration is, is a real advantage. Would you comment on, um, as a, an arbitrator, on the difference between the rules that govern the arbitration and the rules that we dealt with as judges in court? Would you make any kind of comment about well, there's considerable overlap and and some differences. Um, I guess one thing I would mention is is I've had one case that's at an early stage of of arbitration where the arbitration provision in the contract essentially says you can do anything that you'd be able to do under the rules of civil procedure. Well, okay, I'm thoroughly familiar with the rules of civil procedure. That's what we'll do. Uh, it does mean that it's going to take longer than other arbitrations might take, and there's going to be probably more motion practice and maybe some of the what might otherwise be the economies of of arbitration may not be there with that kind of an agreement, but with that kind of agreement, that's what we'll do. Um, I, I think the standard rules, of course, are, are more provide for more limited discovery, um, more limited motion practice, uh, and, and that is often more efficient for the parties. So do you, is that how you see it? I think so. You mentioned uh, neutral case evaluation earlier, Judy. Are there particular skills that you bring to that role at JAMS? Um, I think every experienced judge develops a feel for how a set of facts may appear to a fact finder, whether judge or jury. Uh, superior court judges develop familiarity with many areas of the law because of the wide variety of cases the court handles uh, and develop familiarity with how juries see cases in a wide variety of factual settings. Um, Superior Court judges rotate from county to county. I know people have lots of views about uh, whether that's a good thing, um, but one of the things it means is that as a Superior Court, court judge, you sit in a number of different places over your career, and you see how juries differ in different places, and they do differ in different places. Uh, and you can bring that to looking at a case or a potential case um, and having a pretty good sense about uh, how this would look to a fact finder in Suffolk County or in Norfolk County um, and various ways that it might be presented uh, that would affect how it looks. Um, so I think having tried many different cases in model, multiple counties over many years and ruled on legal issues in many different areas, I, I think I bring a perspective that can assist counsel mm -hmm. in evaluating the prospects of litigating a potential matter, uh, as well as potential alternative approaches. So I'm, I'm glad to do it. Uh, I hope it's helpful. Let me again uh, shift in a slightly different direction. During my years at JAMS, I have often been asked by the parties, occasionally by the court, uh, to serve as a special master, uh, often in a discovery dispute, uh, sometimes in the implementation of agreements or of orders or other aspects of the litigation process. Do you see that role as drawing on your judicial experience? And is that something that you would be interested in, in doing? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I. I occasionally appointed a special master when I was a judge uh, to work with the parties on aspects of a case that required more time and depth than I could give as a judge. Um, now, of course, I, I feel like I can keep my caseload as a level, at a level that allows me to delve deeply into a matter uh, and guide it through the process. Uh, and, and I feel I have the skills to do that putting those skills together with 
the time that's that's available to a jams neutral uh, I, I feel I can approach that in in the way that it needs to be approached uh, and I look forward to doing that we have an enormous uh, amount of talent listening to us today. We've had an opportunity to uh, see the list of those who indicated that they were attending. And I think what we would be interested in doing now is shifting. We can't see you, but we are shifting to uh, see whether you've got any particular questions that you might be interested in asking of us. So maybe we could just take a minute or two, Judy, and uh, provide the attendees with the opportunity, if they wish, uh, to, uh, to to provide us with a question that we might uh, be able to respond to. And, and I think, unless people want us to, we wouldn't attribute the questions. Um, but but we are happy to to uh, have some questions. We have um, a question um, which asks us what we feel is most unhelpful from an attorney or a party during a mediation. Um, and maybe I can start with that, uh, given my uh, more years of experience um, at JAMS, um, by stating that we all recognize um, I think every neutral at JAMS recognizes the fact that emotion plays an enormous role in a dispute, regardless of the nature of the dispute. And it is impossible not to bring that to the day of mediation. We recognize that, we try to recognize that, I think we try to address it. And our role as mediators is, is important in addressing that. But one of the things that I have found over the years that generates um, emotion are accusations of bad faith and good faith. And I'm not talking about um, chapter 93A of the general laws, which often its use is a detriment in mediation. Uh, I think that it's advisable if there's a 93A claim to just put it in the corner for purposes of mediation. And, and I'm now talking about the punitive damages and the re uh, recovery of attorney's fees aspect of that. But I guess um, sort of in, in, in generalizing, I think that to the extent that emotion can be controlled and, and I recognize how hard it is to do that. Um, that, that is something that um, attorneys can play an enormous role in helping the mediator with and advising the mediator prior to the mediation. Judy? Yeah, and, and frankly, I think 93A is, is a detriment in court in the same way that it's a detriment in, in mediation. I mean, it, it is, it's pled in, in nearly every civil case. It, it's, it leads to a, 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 an award in very, very few cases. And, and often, at least my sense is that parties think that they're gonna get treble damages and attorney's fees when the attorneys knows full well that that's highly unlikely. Uh, and it, it raises a set of expectations in the party, in the client, uh, that makes it that much more difficult to resolve. And particularly when the claims of bad faith go to opposing counsel, that inevitably raises emotions that make it very difficult to resolve a case. So I, I think those kinds of claims should be reserved for the really rare instance when it's, when it's really necessary. 
And we have one other question, uh, which has to do, it will not surprise anybody in attendance that we would be asked this question, but which has to do with our views about the role that gender plays in both mediation and in arbitration. Um, so I think I'm gonna start with asking Judy what uh, role she thinks gender plays in terms of the court process. And then I will think about an answer to the question in, in terms of the judiciary, I guess that, that's what. You know, it's there, it's always there. It always will be there. It, it's there in every aspect of our day. Um, it, it, we actually had a, a seminar for judges just recently um, that I participated in, even though I'm retired because I had started the organizing process for it back before I retired. Um, and, and I think sort of the one central takeaway um, from, from that seminar for, for the judge was that you need to call it out when you see it. You need to call it out in a way that doesn't raise the temperature. So if you can do it with a little bit of humor, that's usually effective. Um, I, I know that, you know, we talked about the, the frequently mentioned phenomenon of uh, in a meeting, uh, a woman makes, raises some suggestion and nobody responds and then a man raises the same suggestion and everybody says, great idea. And, and one woman said, what I would say to that is, yes, and are you going to cite me in a footnote? And, and, you know, everybody would laugh. I, I thought that was a great idea because everybody would laugh, but the point is made. And, and I, I think the takeaway is you can and should make the point, but you need to develop techniques for doing it that keep the temperature down. And, and I think lawyers need to do that in the same way the judges need to do it. We have, I see a couple of other questions here. I see one in the chat and I see one in the Q and A. Uh, do I get a, a chance to respond? Um, yeah, go to it. <laughs> no, no, no. I, and I'm going to let you I, I, uh, raise the other questions, Judy. Um, I've given some thought to this issue of the role that gender plays in arbitration and mediation. And I think um, my response in part is that, of course, it plays some role. But I am astonished by the number of times I'm told in mediations that I've been selected as a mediator, not because of my gender, not because I've been on the court, but because I'm a Midwesterner. <laughs> and because somebody believes that there is something about the fact that I grew up in the Midwest, which means that it might affect the ability to handle the case. So I say that because I think that all of the, uh, everything, all of the attributes that a jams neutral brings to a particular dispute probably affects the selection of the particular um, mediator or arbitrator and our handling of the dispute. Over to you, Judy, for um, any of the other questions. Okay, so, so here's a question that's in the chat. How is the process of teaching the judge or arbitrator different in ADR versus court? I'm thinking of complex industries, complicated expert issues, and other factual complexities where a tutorial would be helpful, but hard to do in court. And I, I guess the way I'm understanding this question is it, in court, quite often, one of the things the lawyer needs to do is educate the judge about some factual matter that you're, you're presenting expert witnesses, you're presenting published material so that the judge develop, develops an understanding of some technical matter uh, that the judge wouldn't previously have had, uh, or um, there is some specialized area of the law that the judge may not know about, uh, and you need to teach the judge about that. So that's what I'm, I take this question to refer to, and I think the the question is, how do you do that in arbitration? Um, maybe, maybe the source of the question can just tell me quickly in the chat whether I've understood the, the question correctly. Um, and I guess I, I, I turn that to you, Margaret, and, and ask if, if you think that, that doing that in arbitration is any different from doing that in court. I don't. Don't. That's my sense too, is, is you do basically the same thing, 
Um, now, mediation may be a little different, but I think it's it's fundamentally, you know, to the extent that mediation involves having to evaluate what's likely to happen in litigation and talking to the parties about what's likely to happen in litigation, the judge, the arbitrator needs to be familiar with that area of the law, needs to have some basic understanding if there's some technical matter. Um, and if it, if it isn't something that would be within the mediator's previous experience, you need to provide the information that the mediator needs. But I would take that back to something I said before that some lawyers find a way to do it that is organized and accessible and not overwhelming and some lawyers less so. And I think you wanna be in the former category. Uh, we have a question from a very experienced practitioner, um, both experienced in terms of traditional litigation and I think experienced in terms of ADR who asks, who comments as follows. He knows that mediation is often, he says, an organic process, but he asks what counsel or what counsel in connection with the mediator can do with the counsel's client in advance of the mediation to help make the mediation day more efficient. Do you have any um, response to that, Judy? Um, I, I guess what I would say, but I wanna hear what you have to say about this. What I would say is it's really important that counsel make sure the client understands what the role of the mediator is and isn't, understands that the mediator is not the decision maker, uh, that this is, that the outcome, if it's a successful outcome, will be something that the client agrees to, not a decision that the mediator will make. Do you have other, other views? No, I agree with that. Um, I also think to the extent that um, counsel can provide advance information to the mediator about um, the unusual aspects of the client, that that is helpful. And that uh, if in fact, Council has then informed the client that that information has been imparted, uh, particularly in, in, in certain kinds of disputes. I think that that is also um, uh, helpful and, and good advice. We also have a question, and I think we are pretty close to the end of our fireside chat in terms of time, but we have a question from one of the attendees who says uh, that he works in international transactions and dispute resolution. And he's wondering to what extent JAMS engages in international dispute resolution. And he wonders whether there's a specialization within the JAMS roster in this area. And, and I think the uh, both of us can respond uh, most um, adamantly that there is um, a specialization uh, both within our office in terms of um, several of our colleagues and there is a, a specialization and a, a, a growing specialization, I think, um, with international uh, dispute resolution at JAMS. And that information, more information on that can be provided by contacting uh, Kristen Schuck, who you saw at the beginning of our, of our session and who is the Boston business manager. And she can certainly provide um, a great deal of, of other information, including um, printed material that provides material about that. And I, I see one other question here that says, when you were on the bench, what did you think of ADR roles like neutral analysis and arbitration? Um, and, and what I would say is, I don't think I knew anything about <laughs> neutral analysis. I, you know, it's not the sort of thing that ever comes to the attention of the judge. The judge wouldn't know if it had happened um, before the case was filed or at some point in the case. Um, arbitration, of course, we did know about. Um, and, you know, there were times when we worried that uh, things might go to arbitration that we wanted to have in court because we wanted to establish um, legal principles. We wanted matters to go up and get resolved on appeal so that we would have precedent. But I think the reality is that 
most of what goes to arbitration really isn't in that category. Indeed, most of what happens in litigation, maybe particularly in the business litigation session, mostly involves contract disputes where it's really a matter of interpreting a particular contract. Um, and so parties may, may conclude that they are best off to do it in litigation, or they may conclude that they are best to do it in uh, arbitration. Um, but the, the concern that I think some of us have had over, over time that um, it, it, we're somehow risk losing development of the law, I, I think that concern has abated. Um, I see, I May see- I just make one, one comment. Um, my sense is from talking with um, appellate judges that many of them anticipate that um, counsel would be using some form of neutral evaluation before the appellate advocacy occurs. Um, I agree with Judy that it is much less, I didn't know about it, I, I don't think at all um, when I was sitting on the, on the trial court. And of course I was never an appellate judge, but I think that probably at that, at that level, it is anticipated. All right, Judy, over to you. There's another question. Yes. Yeah, so, so the I see a question that says, "I represented, I represent a terminated employee in a FINRA arbitration. Opposing counsel refuses to mediate unless I considerably lower my my demand, which I'm hesitant to do, um, because there are substantial trauma damages and attorney's fees at stake. Any advice on how I should handle? And and obviously, we can't give advice about how to handle a particular case. Uh, I do think this question illustrates something we said earlier, which is that it, when the client has come to believe that the client is, is, has a significant likelihood of recovering multiple damages and attorney's fees, that gets in the way of resolution. Uh, and if that expectation isn't really based in reality, it becomes that much more difficult to, to resolve a case. Margaret, do you have views on this? I agree with you, Judy. And I think with that, um, I suspect all of the attendees uh, recognize that one of the virtues of this fireside chat is that you have had an opportunity uh, to see Judy Fabricant uh, respond um, with, her usual uh, accomplished and articulate uh, answers to a series of questions. Uh, it has been a, a rare privilege to have worked with her on the Superior Court and to begin working with her at JAMS. Certainly uh, to the extent that you have any additional questions about JAMS itself, again, I refer you to our uh, business manager, Kristen Shuck, for responding to those questions. And I think maybe over to Kristen, she may have something else that she wants to say. I just wanted to jump on to, to thank you both, uh, Judges Fabricant and Hinkle. This was a really great program. I think we all got a lot of really great information from it. Um, thank you everyone for asking questions and you know being responsive listeners to this program today. I did put my email in the chat. So if anybody has follow-up questions they want asked or information they need, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, I'm always available to you. And yeah, if there's nothing else, I think that's it. So thank you very much for the program today. Really wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye, everyone.